Hi everyone, this is Mrs. Tevis Finn, recording from room 114. Welcome to the big three. So we're looking at the effects of industrialization. The three things for today's presentation are immigration, urbanization, and the rise of unions. So let's get right into immigration. So I want you guys to note the push and pull factors that, remember from last um, night's video, um, you know, 17 million immigrants come. So what drives them would be pushing, such as poverty, war, political tyranny, religious oppression, and overpopulation or crowding. Uh, the pull factors, bringing them to the promised land, right? The abundant land we spoke of, job opportunities, um, definitely a higher standard of living, a democratic government, and a chance to climb the social ladder, which was really unheard of in their home countries. So note those two sets of factors. And there are two um, waves, you know, east and west. So I want you guys to kind of review Atlantic would be, um, you know, coming into the New York's Harbor and Ellis Island would be after 1892. Um, so they are there to be processed. Uh, you guys should know 12 million passed through uh, Ellis Island for these medical inspections. Um, sometimes they'd be sent back to Europe if they were marked for either a mental disability or heart conditions or a scalp issue. Uh, so that's that side. And then the Pacific, uh, you guys should know, uh, mainly based out of San Francisco Bay and Angel Island is the name of the barracks. Um, sometimes they would keep the men there for months waiting for results from their hearings. So we're going to dig a little deeper into the stories of these people, but please look at these masses coming into Ellis Island. Um, we're going to look into the three main groups. Um, for here would be the Italians and the East Europeans. Um, I definitely want you guys looking into the Chinese. I mean, check out uh, the barracks here where they'd be waiting. And they were there so long that this is what they carved into the walls on, El on Angel Island. So let's go into the next effect. So number two is urbanization. And after the Civil War, cities grew at an enormous rate. For example, guys, New York City grew from 800,000 in 1860 to 3.5 million in 1900. That's just explosive growth. So this extreme congestion, we're going to see what the effects are. But you guys, Chicago had the first skyscraper here on the left. And you guys should know, you know, immigrants settled into these cities. It's where it was cheap and affordable. Um, so they lived with their own ethnic groups in neighborhoods such as this. Uh, you know, an example would be Little Italy. Uh, it's where they could speak their native language, uh, recreate, you know, their homeland with churches, clubs, and newspapers. So the congestion leads to Chicago's first elevated railway system, pictured here, and also New York City had the first subway, Boston soon after. So guys, working class families lived in these crowded apartment buildings called tenements. So they really squeezed themselves here. Um, families would, you know, to make ends meet, would even rent out any available space to single tenants. Um, conditions, as you can see here in the picture, were squalid. Um, diseases spread rapidly. So before we move on, this is where your factory workers lived. So, you know, the factory workers are enduring long hours, dangerous conditions, and low wages. So a solution is to band together and form unions. So this is the third fact, and this will be the biggest one. So guys, I did give you some bullets to take down. So, you know, early unions were mostly skilled craftsmen called trade unions. Um, and employers were kind of stuck, right? Because they had to negotiate sometimes with these workers because they needed their skills. And also sometimes they didn't trust them because, you know, they wanted to run their business the way they saw fit. And they, they saw unions as interference. So companies could uh, require workers to sign contracts, you know, promising not to join a union. Others would hire detectives and place any worker who tried to unionize on a blacklist. So you guys should know a blacklist so no company would hire them. Uh, if workers did form unions, the company could use lockouts. So I want you guys to know a lockout is where they kept the workers out and they didn't pay them. Uh, if a union called a strike, the company could actually hire replacement workers. You guys should put down that they sometimes those replacement workers 
were nicknamed scabs. Unions, you guys should know, were associated with radicals. If you guys don't know the guy on the left, that is Karl Marx. You guys should just review his basic theory that class struggle is inherent, right? It's, it's between the workers and the owners, which would lead to revolution, where the workers would take control. Um, they, they definitely want to distribute the wealth evenly you know, after this revolution and create a classless society. So guys, many workers supported this idea and even embraced anarchism, which is a belief in no government. The picture on the right, you know, looks a little threatening. So the reputation is shaky. So the most important thing before I get into this strike, guys, is this: these pictures here should kind of give you a sense that immigrant workers were associated with radical ideas. And so employers definitely became suspicious of unions just with, you know, a reputation from Marx. So economic times lead to strikes, guys. There's a panic in 1873, which is a severe recession and some wage cuts. In a few years after, there becomes... Um, a massive walk-off a job. It's called the Great Railroad Strike. So just checking out the photos, they did walk off their job and they blocked the tracks. Um, you know, they were protesting uh, a wage cut. So guys, strikes spread throughout the whole country. I want you to know that 80,000 workers went on strike, affecting two-thirds of the nation's railways. Um, governors sent out state militias, and so there were violent confrontations. It took 12 days to restore order, leaving 100 dead and 10 million, check out here guys on the right, 10 million dollars in railroad property was destroyed. So unions are not getting a good reputation from this incident. One of the early unions I want you guys to know is the Knights of Labor. So put down it was 1869 formed by Terence Powderly. Here's a picture of the early members. They opposed strikes uh, they favored boycotting and arbitration. Arbitration, you guys should know, is where a third party helps negotiate. So put down their goals. Um, they advocated for an eight-hour workday, equal pay for women, an end to child labor, and a creation of worker-owned factories. They even welcomed blacks. So I have a question here. Are they ahead of their time? Yeah, they were way too radical for this, for this era. They did have success with uh, railroad wage cuts, and it did lead to a huge increase in their membership. So they did have limited success, and here is one of their failures. So guys, May 1st, 1886 was a nationwide strike to support the eight-hour workday. Um, so in Chicago, the local Knights of Labor led a march of 80,000 workers. The police intervened and it turned violent. The police killed four strikers and you guys can see here on the right a local anarchist group met to protest. You guys remember an anarchist group their belief is in no government so they're the most radical. It's what you, what, uh, you know uh, employers would fear the worst. Um, so guys this radical group in this protest here is a great sketch from the era. A bomb was thrown and one police officer was killed. Six others were wounded, but this led to, you know, it was like rapid, uh, an all-out battle between both sides, as you can see here. Um, so wounding up to 100 people, and this led to an arrest of eight people. Seven guys were German immigrants with ties to anarchism. The trial was based on weak evidence. Here's a sketch from the era showing the courtroom. And all were convicted, and four shown here were executed. So guys, um, I would say the Knights of Labor after this, you know, their reputation was shot. For bonus, I'd like you guys to check out the Homestead and the Pullman strikes. So those are other famous um, battles between employers and workers, you know, calling in uh, the state militias to restore order. Right, we have three more groups to learn about. Guys, the AFL is the American Federation of Labor. It is the dominant union of the late 1800s into the 1900s. Several national trade unions merged to form it, and it focused on the interest of skilled workers. Here's their first president. I want you guys to put down Samuel Gompers, and here's their logo. He steered away from confrontation and controversy. He focused on the bread and butter issues, such as hours, wages, and conditions. Put down their three goals. 
have some music in the background, but they wanted union recognition, right? They wanted um, companies to agree to collective bargaining. They wanted a closed shop. They wanted companies only to hire union members, and they wanted an eight-hour workday. So guys, there were 500,000 members by 1900, and it was mostly white men. Check out the different logos here. These guys, you can see, are more radical. They have a, um, you know, even just the use of the color red, and look at the guy's muscles. So the Industrial Workers of the World is the IWW, and um, they wanted to include both skilled and unskilled workers. And they were based on a socialist belief that workers and employers had nothing in common. Their nickname was the Wobblies, um, and they had really just one successful strike, which I'll show you. So this is in our state, Lawrence, Massachusetts, 1912. They organized textile workers to protest a cut in wages. It lasted so long and turned so violent, they sent their own children away. It did last 10 weeks, and they were able to get an increase in wages. The last group I want to cover is the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. Here's the acronym, here's a great picture, and here's what they would sew into their garments to make sure you only bought union-made clothing. Guys, they were Jewish and Italian immigrants. Um, New York City was their main base. Um, they did lead a successful strike in 1909 of 20,000 garment workers to win union recognition. All right, I want to get cut off because this is, this is like very important stuff. But guys, women had a hard time getting equal pay because it was assumed that they had a man taking care of them at home. So, you know, their work, even as domestic servants, teachers, nurses, sales clerks, and definitely in factories, they had to work extra hard. So this kind of union recognition for better wages and benefits is really hard fought. Um, so we're going to look at their stories more closely in the next unit. This is Mrs. Tevis Finn signing off.